um, uh, every day, you guys probably know this, uh, we are bombarded with choices that we have to make. In fact, somehow they keep track of this, and they have found uh, that each day we have to make between 33 and 35,000 uh, conscious decisions. I'm not talking about habits, just autoplay, anything like that. 33 to 35,000 decisions every single day. So just turn to your neighbor and say, this is why you're tired, right? Okay, because it is. It's why you're tired all the time, because like there's so many, many choices that we have to make, and a a lot of times, all of these choices are difficult because it's, we've got to choose between something, and we've got to make a, a commitment, and committing to something can be very, very hard. Tell me if this happens in your house. You head off to the grocery store, and you spend about $1,000 an hour, and, and you, you go in there, and you bring all that food back into the house, and now it is time for, for dinner, and you open up the fridge, and it's like, well, we could make this. We could make this. We could make this. Do you want to do this? Do you want to do that. Do, what about this? You know what? Let's just go have Mexican. Come on now, anybody, anybody in the room, right? That's exactly what happens. Or you're, you're sitting there on the couch and you're, it's like, let's find something new to watch on Netflix. We're going to scroll, we're going to scroll, we're going to scroll, we're going to scroll. 30 minutes later, we're still scrolling. You know what? Let's just watch The Office again, right? And, and it's like, well, we're just going to go back to a show that we've already done. Or, or you're trying the low carb, keto, no fun diet. And it's like, I got to get in shape. I got to lose some pounds. It's got to get the cholesterol down so the doctor doesn't yell at me. And, and you drive by the Krispy Kreme, and it's got the red light on. And it's like, I got to make a choice, one donut or 12, right? You know, it's like, what do I do? What do I do? And every day, we are faced with all these decisions that we have to make, and it can be a struggle for us to make a commitment. It reminds me of a story. There's a guy named Homer. He's in love with a girl named Sue, and she's just the, the girl of his dreams, and he just musters up the courage one day to propose to her, and so he, he gets down on one knee and says, Sue, I, I, I know I'm not wealthy like Tom. I know that I'm not as good looking as Tom. I'm definitely not as smart as Tom is, but Sue, I... I love you. I, I want you to marry me. And Sue is just moved. I mean, here's this man just pouring his heart out in front of her and asking her to marry. And she said, looks at Homer and says, oh, Homer, I love you too. But can you tell me more about Tom? And so <laughs> it can be a struggle to make a commitment, right? We can find ourselves torn from, from time to time, torn between something that we, we want to love, that we want to choose, that we want to do, and, and something else that has captured our attention. And what that does is it creates turmoil inside of us. In fact, there is a phrase that you will hear from time to time from a friend, especially if they're wrestling with a decision, and it'll be something like this. They'll say, I feel like I am being pulled in two different, finish it, directions, which sounds painful to be pulled this way and pulled this way. That is, if somebody says that in your life, just know that they are not saying that from a, a place of peace. That's from a pa place of pain. There's no confidence. Don't know what to do because they feel divided. But let's ask a question. What happens when it's our heart that is divided? What is it that happens whenever we are divided, pulled in two different directions between trusting God and maybe trusting in our own strength or trusting God, trusting in our own cleverness, trusting in God or trusting in our own giftedness, in our own abilities? What happens? When our heart is divided, how can we avoid that? And in week two here of Kings and Kingdoms, we are we're looking at King Hezekiah, um, one of the great kings of Judah. His story is in 2 Kings 18 today is where we're going to be. So if you've got a Bible, I'd love for you to open up to 2 Kings 18. Um, he gets quite the write-up in uh, Scripture. Um, he gets 2 Kings 18 through 20. He also gets 2 Chronicles 29 through 32. So he, he's a significant king. And his, his family tree um, kind of gives hints that this would happen, but then it also doesn't. So his great-grandpa is the uh, King Uzziah. 
and uh, his grandpa is the King Jotham. And both of those guys were wise and godly. They were good kings. Now, at this point in Israel's history, just to kind of catch you up, there are, it's not one kingdom. It's actually two kingdoms. There's the northern kingdom that is called Israel, then the southern kingdom that is called Judah. It has been like that since after Solomon's death. So for years and years and years now, a couple hundred years, it's been divided. And whenever you look at the landscape of the kings of Judah, which is Hezekiah's family line, uh, there's a lot of kings that are good. There's some that are bad. There's some that are okay. There's some that are really bad, but it's kind of an up and down, up and down thing. And that's what happens in Hezekiah's family line too, because as good as Uzziah and Jotham were, his dad Ahab was awful. Just, just awful. He was a train wreck. Um, he um, led the nation in pagan worship as the king of Israel, uh, Judah. Um, he actually ends up sacrificing one of his sons in the fire to a foreign god. He does renovations in the temple of the Lord so that they can practice um, sacrifices to foreign gods. I mean, that's not a great building project there if you, you're not paying attention there. And he also ends up stripping the temple of all of its treasure so that he can pay um, tribute to Assyria who is battling Israel to the north. He is a train wreck. He really is. And so from this family tree comes young Hezekiah. Let's, let's read verses 1 through 8. Together, This is what it says. Hezekiah, son of Ahaz, began to rule over Judah in the third year of King Hoshea's reign in Israel. He was 25 years old when he became king, and he reigned in Jerusalem 29 years. His mother was Abijah, the daughter of Zechariah, and he did what was pleasing in the Lord's sight. And listen to this phrase, just as his ancestor David had done. He removed the pagan shrine, smashed the sacred pillars, and cut down the Asherah poles. He broke up the bronze serpent that Moses had made because the people of Israel had been offering sacrifices to it. The bronze serpent was called Nehushtan. Hezekiah trusted in the Lord, the God of Israel. There was no one like him among all the kings of Judah, either before or after his time. He remained faithful to the Lord in everything, and he carefully obeyed all the commands the Lord had given Moses. So the Lord was with him, and Hezekiah was successful in everything he did. He revolted against the king of Assyria and refused to pay him tribute, and he also conquered the Philistines as far distant as Gaza and its territory from their smallest outpost to their largest walled city." Hezekiah, Hezekiah, Hezekiah. So he's 25 years old whenever he begins his reign. And like most 25-year-olds, he's fed up with the system, right? And he's just like, there's, there's got to be a better way to do something. We need to do something new because in this time in Judah's history, I mean, they are a dumpster fire. And, and honestly, they're like a dumpster fire with a grease fire thrown inside of it. I mean, it's just, it is a mess. Um, their economy is in a depression. Um, they have failed foreign relations. Um, Assyria had to be paid off, and so that's why they are now broke and in this depression. They've got a paper mache army, and they can't defend their own cities. And spiritually and morally, it is a cesspool. It's just disgusting. And Hezekiah wants to make a difference because he's somebody who has character. He really does. He's got great character, and we know he didn't get it from his dad, but he is a man with great character character. And under his leadership, he ends up bringing about revival. And I'm not for sure that he knew everything that he was doing, what it was all going to lead to. But here's the thing. Hezekiah got stuff done, and he got the right stuff done. And if you want to know how, and this is, you can write this off to the side of your notes. It's like, how did this like, great revival happen in this nation over the 29 years of Hezekiah being king? And it's just this. It's because he got rid of sin in the nation. He got rid of it. That's what he did. And sin for the people of Judah had become a part of their religion. That's what the writer is covering there in those first four verses or so. It says, you know, he destroyed the pagan shrines. In other translations, it's going to be called the high places, which are just simply um, these elevated sites throughout Israel and Judah that they had built on mountains and hills so that uh, people could go off and uh, perform sacrifices to foreign gods like Baal and Asherah. 
Now, if you're, you're new to church or new to the Bible, um, just so you know, that's like a no-no in the entire Old Testament. It's like, you don't have any gods other than me. That's like number one on the list, right? And so, but what they did is they like built all these sites all across the nation so that people could just go up there and worship anytime they wanted these false gods. They had turned it into a convenience store kind of religion. Just go over here, go over here, I'll worship that, I'll worship that. And so he destroys all those shrines. It says that he destroys the sacred pillars, which are these other places that they would go to sacrifice to. This was all about prosperity. It would be like, you got a great big sales call and I wanna make sure I make my numbers, gotta make sure we make this deal. And so you would go off to these sacred pillars, offer a sacrifice, and go, all right, you got to help me meet my numbers, foreign God. And that's what they do. He tore all those down. He destroyed the Asherah poles, which don't ever Google that, all right, because those things are crazy. They're these goddesses of the Canaanites. And essentially what, what they decided and what they taught was that you worshiped your God through things like sexual immorality. And it was just disgusting stuff. And that was all over the landscape in Judah. And he tore them all down. But then... There's that interesting one there. You see that one there in verse 4 about how he destroyed this bronze serpent named Nehushtan? What in the world are we talking about here? This is a crazy story. This, this bronze serpent here is 700 years old at this point. And it comes from the, the book of Numbers, Numbers chapter 21. And the, the story is, is as Moses has led the people out of Egypt and they're headed off to the promised land, um, there's a large group of these Israelite people. And I don't know if this surprises you or not, but sometimes you get large groups of people together and they start complaining. I don't know if that's surprising to you or not, but it does happen. And so the people start complaining. They're complaining about everything. They're complaining about the food. They're complaining about the water. They're complaining about Moses. They should have just left us in Egypt. At least we had food there. And so God just gets sick of it. And so he sends a plague against the Israelites of poisonous snakes to get their attention. The snakes start biting. This is in your Bible. This is why you should read your Bible. Okay. And the snakes start biting people and they start dying left and right. And then they're like, oh no, we're dying from the snake bites. What should we do? We should repent. And so they cry out to God, God, forgive us for everything. And so God tells Moses, all right, here's how, what we're going to do. You're going to build a bronze snake, put it up on a pole. Whoever looks at this snake is going to be healed from the poisonous bites and they won't die. So they did, and it's, it's an incredible story. Well, apparently, they take this bronze snake, and they wrap it in bubble wrap and put it in styrofoam, because 500 years later, whenever Solomon builds the temple, there's some curator going around and looking through the stuff, says, you know what we should do? Here's this snake we've been carrying around for 500 years. Let's get it out of storage, and let's put it up in the temple, and it's going to serve as a reminder for people of what God did to redeem us, how God saved us. And it should serve as a reminder of, for us to not be a complaining, mumbling, grumbling group of people. It's to be a reminder so that whenever a dad takes his son into the temple and his son looks up and he goes, Dad, that's a big snake. He's like, yes, it is, son. Do you know what the story is behind that snake? Whenever your great, 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 great granddad was in the wilderness... And it's to be a reminder of God's redemption. It was an object lesson. But what happened over the years is that the object lesson became an object of worship. And people started lighting incense and offering sacrifices to this bronze snake. And so Hezekiah looks at that and goes, nah, that ain't good. And so he took it and he tore it down. And I'm pretty certain that he tore it down to no applause. I'm confident that there was a committee called Save the Snake. <laughs> I'm pretty confident they had slogans of, don't get rid of the snake, get rid of Hezekiah. You know, I'm sure that they, they talked about all those things. And there were a lot of people who would have rather have kept all these idols and gotten rid of Hezekiah. But he was faithful. And he stayed the course. And he did what was right because he was convinced that God wanted to do something new. And can I just say that that is what great leaders do. They do what is right, not just what is safe, not just what is popular. That's what great leaders do. Verse 5 says that Hezekiah, he trusted in the Lord. 
He had placed his hope, his expectation in God. He had a, a bold confidence and security in God. And this trust was not a tentative trust. It was a deep and abiding trust. In fact, th this word really does. Now, I tell you, this is what defines Hezekiah. I mean, this is how much so. So that word trusted in the Hebrew that this was originally uh, written in shows up 10 times in chapters 18 and 19. 10 times. But if you were to go from Genesis to the end of Kings and count the references that where, that where that word is used, not referring to Hezekiah, it's only used three times. So this is Hezekiah's character. He is defined by his radical trust in God, and this is what makes him different than any other king that came before him and that was after him. He wholeheartedly devoted himself to God, and the results of that wholehearted devotion is prosperity. I mean, the, the nation became financially stable. They had victory over their enemies. They were finally able to defeat Assyria, who had been in their hair for 100 years. They were able to finally defeat the Philistines, who for 300 years had been a thorn in their flesh. There was no king like Hezekiah. There really wasn't, either before him or after his time. In fact, here's how the writer of Chronicles will describe him. He says this in chapter 31, verse 21. It says, in all that he did in the service of the temple of God and in his efforts to follow God's laws and commands, Hezekiah sought his God. Come on, let's say this together. He sought his God how? Wholeheartedly. And as a result, he was very successful. His success came from his wholeheartedness. That's where it all came from. He had an unwavering faith that led not just to military victory and financial prosperity, but it led to a spiritual revival in the nation. So friends, wholehearted living is this idea that we are going to give every part of our lives to God that we're not going to hold anything back, we're not going to be divided, we're not going to be torn, we're going to walk the narrow path, we're going to trust him with every decision, every fear, and with every opportunity. That is wholehearted living. We are going to root out distractions and idols from our life. And so in our remaining time together, I just want to ask this question, so how do we do this? How do we live a wholehearted life. If this is the key, how do we do this? And I want to give you just a really simple outline. The first thing that we've got to learn to do is we have to learn to be present. Everybody say, be present. Be present. That's what we're talking about. Hezekiah, remember, he trusted in the Lord. That's what he did. He consistently sought the Lord. This is about presence and being present. And I know that just saying be present, that being present leads to wholeheartedness, it, it sounds simple, right? But we also know it's not easy. Being present is one of the most difficult things that we can do right now because everything is fighting for our attention. It is so easy to be distracted, easy to drift away. So like, let me, let me give you a hypothetical. I know you go to Corinth and so this has never happened to you, okay? So I, I understand this, but have you ever been on a Zoom call? for work or maybe school, and there's a lot just going on, and somebody's just droning on and on and on and on, and so you just start checking out. Once again, this doesn't happen to you. This is other people. I know this. And so hypothetically, you turn the camera off, and then maybe you mute the microphone, and then hypothetically, you start texting somebody else in the meeting, not about the meeting, about something else, or hypothetically, you start scrolling Instagram or Facebook or TikTok, or hypothetically, you start cooking dinner and folding laundry or working out, you know, hypothetically <laughs> speaking, right? No, nobody here would ever do that. But right, what, what happens? It's like, well, we got distracted. And that distraction kind of leads to a disinterest. And the same thing can happen to us spiritually if we're not present. Church, hear me, you've got an enemy. We, we, I try to remind you of this of all time, all the time. You have a spiritual enemy. And he is a master at getting you distracted or disinterested in what God is trying to do in your life. And he is an expert at this. It is what he is best at doing. And if you and I, if we are not careful, we will allow the distractions to cause us to drift from being present which it's impossible to be, to be wholehearted if we're continually distracted. Because to be wholehearted, it requires us being present. And I wonder, how many times do we miss it just because we're not present? 
This has been bugging me lately. One of the things that's been bugging me um, lately is that little notification. I don't know if it pops up on your phone on Sundays or not, but it's my, my screen time um, notification. It's like, here's how long you average today on your phone, you know, those things. And it's been bugging me lately. And uh, the, the main culprit is whenever I'm home at work, whatever, I'm busy, that's fine. But I get home and it's after dinner and we're watching whatever we're watching, just, just start scrolling through Twitter. And I'll just scroll and I'll scroll and I'll scroll. Have the, have the Chiefs traded for a wide receiver with two functional knees and two hands yet? You know, it's just like, has this happened yet? What, what political nonsense is going on here? What is happening there? What's going on here? Oh, that's funny. You know, and it's just going on and all these kind of things. And it's bugged me. Because as I sit and I just think about how much time I just waste doing that, the, the question that I just wrestled with is like, is that helping me be more or less present? Is it helping me be more or less present, you know, with my wife, with, with, with my family, with what God is trying to talk to me about? What's it doing? In fact, I think that's a great question to just kind of wrestle with. And, and it would be this. Write this off to the side in your notes. This won't be on the screen. But here's the question. Am I more present with or without blank? You've got to fill in the blank. Am I more present with or without blank? Because here, here's what we're really asking. What are the things in your life that help you be present with God? What are those things? What are the things in your life that actually help you stay present with God? It could be something like you would probably you might write down, well, my small group, that helps me stay present with God, you know, because we're getting together, we're going through, we're praying together, we're eating together. You know, it could be something like, and it should be something like attending worship on a weekly basis. That helps me to stay in the rhythm and just remind myself that there is a God, that it is not me. It can be things like my, my daily rhythms, my daily habits. It could be things like going to counseling. But what are the things that help me stay present with God. And then the flip side of the coin is, or what are the things that I do better at staying present without them in my life? It could be the name of a friend that's just dragging you away. It could be your phone, your, your social media, or it's like, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop spending time on the screen, uh, the small screen. I'm going to look at the big screen, my TV. Maybe that's distracting you. It could be a substance. It could be something. What is it? What are those things that you do better at staying present without them in your life? It's really the, the question is, is like, am I a better disciple? Am I, am I a better dad? Am I a better husband? Am I a better pastor with or without these things in my life? That's the question. Because presence is all about creating space for God's word to do something in your life. Be present. Here's the second thing. You want to be wholehearted, you got to be patient. Everybody say, be patient. Be patient. We're going to be patient. And, and I know being patient is hard because uh, we are obsessed with instant results. Uh, we, we don't have an Instapot, but I love the concept of an Instapot. It's like you can have a Crock-Pot meal in 15 minutes. And this is like, that is awesome, you know? It's just like, what, what a great idea. But that's because we are just people who don't like to wait. We want results now. But we've got to remember, church, listen, spiritual growth is not instant. It's a process. It takes time, and I know that we hate that because we are masters at not waiting. We will do anything to not wait, okay? Like, I'm going to call you out right now. How many of y'all, you're driving around the, the road, and you come to a red light, and you're saying, okay, how many, you're starting to count cars, okay? That lane has six cars. That one only has four. Boom. That's where I am going, all right? How many of y'all, you're at Kroger, and you're getting there, and you're going through there, and you've got your, your shopping cart or your buggy, whatever in the world you call it down here, and so, you know, you're, you're going through here, and you get there, and it's like, which one has the shortest line? Which one has the shortest line, all right? And that's where I'm going to go. Tell me if this has happened to you. You're scrolling through Amazon. What do you mean this is going to be here in five days? I paid for Amazon Prime. I want this overnight. Two days? That's too long. Give me one day shipping. I'm not buying that now, right? It's because we want things now, but we got to learn to wait. In fact, Jesus would tell us that patience is necessary for growth because growth doesn't happen overnight. It's going to take time and it's not easy, but you got to learn that there is a purpose in the waiting. There is a reason for it because God has things that he wants to do in you before he does something through you. Hezekiah was 25 years old whenever he became king. 
25 years old. Um, how many of y'all are in, in your 20s right now? Anybody in your 20s in this room at a nine o'clock? So, okay, we got a few at the nine o'clock. All right, that's great. All right, you know, but so I, I remember being in my early 20s, okay? And some of us with gray hair, it's, it's a long trip to get back there, but let's just remember in our early 20s, I remember being like that. It's like, you put me in charge of anything for a week, I'll solve every problem that it has. I just need one week. You guys remember the, the arrogance of youth that you carried around with you? Okay, I'm telling you, I don't think Hezekiah was any different at all. I mean, this dude has been watching his dad just lead his nation down the toilet, and he's been watching it, and he's watched his dad be evil, build these places up, offer sacrifices. Whether he saw his brother sacrificed in the fire or he just heard about his brother being sacrificed in the fire, he knows all about these things. And let me ask you a question. From everything that you know about Hezekiah that I've shared with you so far, do you think he was okay with anything that his dad was doing? But he had to wait. He had to wait. He had to be patient. And while he was waiting, God was preparing him so that whenever he became king, he would get to work. In fact, 2 Chronicles 29 verse 3 says that it was in the first month of the first year of his reign that he started all of these reforms. He didn't have a 100-day plan. He had like a 21-day plan. He's like, I'm getting after it now. I've been waiting and waiting and waiting, and boom, now it is time to get some stuff done. What if, my friends, we learn to view that waiting period as a training period? And just to see it, that God is doing something in you. He's preparing something for you so that whenever your moment comes, just like Hezekiah's came for him, that you are ready to jump in with both feet and say, all right, God has prepared me for this moment. And now I am going to step in and I am going to do what God has called me to do. And I know that in the moment of waiting, it feels like nothing is ever going to come to fruition. And I know it can feel frustrating But trust me, he is preparing you. He's preparing you for that moment. So be patient. Do not lose heart. Don't give up. So if we're going to live a wholehearted life, we've got to learn to be present. We've got to learn to be patient. And then we've got to learn to be persistent. Everybody say be persistent. Be persistent. That's what we've got to do. Now, patience and persistence may feel like they're at odds. It's like, can I be patient and persistent at the same time? It's like, well, yes, I can. Because persistence is to continue firmly in the course of action in spite of difficulty or opposition. Or or, let's use Eugene Peterson. This is a much better way to think of it. It, it, We could define it as this. It is a long obedience in the same direction. Don't you love that? It's a long obedience in the same direction. And the secret to understanding persistence is this. It's not about perfection. It's about persistence. Hezekiah was not a perfect king. He makes a ton of mistakes. You read through the rest of his story, um, you're going to see that he invites the Babylonian leaders into the temple and he shows off the treasury. And God's like, you moron, they're going to come in here and steal it all after this, all right? That's what's going to happen. He seeks help from Egypt in a moment of panic. He apparently fails to disciple his son, Manasseh, who goes on to become one of the most wicked kings in the history of Judah. He struggles with pride. He is not a perfect guy. He was persistent, though. He was faithful. He always pursued faithfulness. And friend, you're not called to perfection. You're called to persistence, to be obediently persistent and to continue to do what is right and to continue to pursue what is good and to do the last thing that God asked you to do. That's persistence. What has he asked me to do most recently? Okay, I'm going to do that. So maybe you're a student today and, you know, you are trying to make a difference in your school and it feels hard because sometimes, you know, it can feel like you're the only person following Jesus in your school and you're, you're trying to do everything that you can. You started a Bible study, you started a ministry, you know, you've started inviting people to church, you started inviting them to youth group, you started telling them about how you're not a perfect person, but you have met a God who forgives your sins and your failures and you've, you, all these things and he is, God is starting to change your life and it feels like nothing is happening, you're doing all the right things, but there is no forward momentum. Keep persisting. Don't you give up now. Keep being 
persistent. Maybe in your marriage, things just aren't going the way that you want them to go. And your spouse and yourself, the, the connection is not where it used to be. Maybe you feel like you're drifting apart and, and you're going in different paths spiritually, emotionally, you know, uh, relationally. And you just feel like things are just going in the wrong direction. And you're trying to do everything that you know to do. You're trying to do the things that you did at first. You're trying to love. You're trying to serve. And it just doesn't feel like it's making one bit of difference. Do not give up. You keep fighting. You keep persisting. You keep serving. You keep loving. You keep on going. You stay engaged. Don't give up. Maybe you work in Corinth Kids on a weekly basis. And if that's you, can I just say this? God bless you. Man alive. Serving at Corinth Kids is one of the greatest things that you can do because kids, it's hard work because kids are great. They're frustrating, but they are so great. But you can get up and you can go week after week after week and you're changing diapers, you're giving out Cheerios, you're giving out goldfish, you're corralling, you're separating, you're doing all these things and you wonder, is all the work that I am doing, is it making a difference? Is I, am I doing anything that matters? And the answer is, yes, you are. What you do matters. Keep serving, keep persisting, keep going. Don't give up. Be persistent. See, today you may have come in here feeling like you're hanging on a thread. You may have walked in here today not feeling like you were ever going to be able to follow through. And can I just say from the bottom of my heart, please, just don't give up. Keep persisting. And, And you might be reluctant. You might be confused. You might be frustrated. And man, I get it. I get it. But just don't give up. Be persistent. Be patient, be present, live wholeheartedly. And here's your bottom line today. Wholehearted living begins with trusting God completely. That's where it all begins. Say, I'm going to trust him just like Hezekiah trusted him. Wholeheartedly, that's where I'm going to go. I'm going to trust God. My challenge to you this week is let's identify and eliminate one distraction. For a week, that's all I'm asking. I'm not telling you, you can't, don't pick up your phone for the rest of your life or anything like that, you know, but may, let's just identify it. You know, is it something like social media? I mean, a, a couple of weeks ago I did this. I just, I was like, man, I, I'm just so frustrated with this. I deleted Twitter, deleted Instagram, deleted Facebook, deleted threads. I didn't even know I had to delete threads, you know, and it's out there. And, and I, I just deleted them all. And lo and behold, the week after that, you want to know what? My screen time went down. What is it? Identify, maybe it's not your phone. Maybe it's the, the big screen. Maybe it's TV. You know, maybe you've got Fox News, MSNBC, CNBC, C-SPAN, whatever it is, on 24-7. And I'll just throw this out here. This is for free. I'm not for sure that watching the news 24 hours a day is good for you. Just going to throw that out there. So it's like, you know what, for a week, I'm just going to eliminate it. And I'm not saying don't ever be informed. That's not what I'm saying. But for a week, say, so you know what, I'm, I'm not going to do that. Hannity will be fine without me, okay? You know, I, it's going to be fine. But just identify and eliminate that one distraction for a week and just see. Just see what that does as you look to live more wholeheartedly. Now, Hezekiah wasn't a perfect king. I mean, this is, this is clear, this is obvious, but I, I, would be, I would be doing preaching malpractice if I didn't tell you that there is a perfect king. And Jesus Christ is the perfect king. He is the one who came to fulfill all that Hezekiah did and could not do. And Jesus Christ is the one who embodies wholeheartedness to the core, who embodies perfect obedience, unconditional love. And what I want you to know about Jesus is that Jesus didn't come to just reform your heart. He came to transform it to give you a brand new heart. And the way that that happens is through his sacrifice on the cross. And it's through the cross that he bridges the gap between us and God. And he offers us a relationship that is not based on our efforts, but on God's amazing grace. And so today I wanna invite you to respond to Jesus, whether that's for the the first time and you're gonna visit the website that's on the screen and say, I'm ready to, to go all in. I feel like I've been pulled in two different directions between the world and what God is calling me to do. And I feel today is the day that I need to go all in with. With Jesus and begin serving him wholeheartedly, whether it's that or maybe you've already made that decision and you just know that there are areas in your life that your heart is divided and you're, you're holding back things from him. 
And so today is your chance to give those over to God. And just like Hezekiah tore down the idols in Judah, you can tear down the idols of your heart. And whether that's control, whether that's fear, whether that's pride, whatever it is. And you say, I'm going to go all in with Jesus and be wholeheartedly devoted to him. So if, if that's you, if there's a decision you want to make today here in person, then I'm going to pray, and I invite you to come up after we're done, and I'd love nothing more than to pray with you today. So God, we ask your blessing over us this morning, and we pray that you would remind us that you have called us to be wholly devoted to you, wholehearted, all in, not trying to, not trying to ride the fence, but all in with you. And so give us the courage and the wisdom to do what we need to do today. And we pray that in the wonderful name of Jesus. Amen and amen. Blessings on your head. We'll see you next week.